I will first briefly introduce our speakers today, um, and then I will talk a little bit about IFAS's work in this area, and then we'll, we'll give quick presentations and hopefully have time for questions. Um, I am joined this morning by Justice Carmen Alanis. She's a member of the High Chamber of the Election Court of the Federal Judiciary Branch in Mexico. She served as a president of the court from August of 2007 to August of 2011. She has nearly 25 years of experience in the public sector. Prior to her current appointment, she served as a federal electoral institute in a variety of capacities. Judge John Thunheim uh, is a US district judge in Minnesota. He was nominated by President Clinton, confirmed by the US Senate, and took the oath of office on December 29, 1995. He has significant international experience in rule of law development, including experience in Kosovo, where he was a principal advisor uh, to the process that developed the Constitution of Kosovo. He's also worked in Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, Moldova, and Jordan, to name a few locations. Finally, uh, Jack Young uh, is, is counsel to Sandler, Reef, Young, and Lamb, where he practices in the area of administrative law and litigation, uh, including regulatory policy and corporate litigation, and a specialist in election dispute resolution. He is also an adjunct professor at the William and Mary College School of Law, teaching comparative election law, election dispute resolution, redistricting, and public participation in the electoral process. Uh, for IFAS's part, we've worked in this area for many, many years, and um, it's largely been, a, in, in, over the last few years, ad hoc, depending on who we send in. There's all kinds of talk about international principles and what should apply to complaints adjudication, what are the standards that countries ought to adhere to. About two years ago, or maybe almost three now, we went into some in-depth study of what kind of principles ought to apply to a complaints adjudication process. And what we found were there were seven principles that seemed to be an area of agreement for almost everyone. And our research found through case law, international public law documents, and experience generally, that there are these seven principles that we believe are a foundation for a complaints adjudication process. We don't say that it's all, the only principles that apply, but I think if a country has these seven standards in place, they're in a very good position to effectively deal with electoral complaints. I'll quickly go through those. The first is the right to redress. Just generally, if someone believes there's been a wrong committed and they have the evidence and facts to prove it, they ought to have the mechanism to be able to file a complaint and get it answered. Secondly, there needs to be a clearly defined regime of election standards and procedures. Everyone involved, parties, candidates, election management bodies, courts, ought to know what the rules of the game are prior to the election and they ought to be able to follow those rules to the conclusion of whatever complaint that has been filed. Third, and this one seems very obvious, but is probably one of the most difficult to actually uh, quantify, is an impartial and informed arbiter. Whoever is hearing the case needs to not only be impartial, but they also need to know the particular aspects of electoral law and what's going to apply. Because as you know, and I'll talk about this briefly or later, in an election situation, you're dealing with a, a very short timeline, but you cannot forget due process protections for those that have filed a complaint, which is the fourth standard, a system that judicially expedites decisions. This is very difficult, and it'll be interesting to hear in Mexico uh, the timelines in which the court deals with and the number of cases that are filed and how they resolve them. It's actually phenomenal, and I know many, of, many courts around the world and EMBs deal with this problem and we need to be, have better technical ways in which to help courts and EMBs deal with this. Fifth is, before the cases are filed, there needs to be established burdens of proof and standards of evidence. Who has the burden to prove the allegations that have been alleged? And what are the standards of evidence that apply? It seems as if clear and convincing is a standard that is becoming fairly common in most of these cases, but it depends on the actual type of complaint. And then the sixth standard is uh, an available meaningful and effective remedies. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Justice Alanis. Thank you for your introduction, Chad. Good morning, all of you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the comparative perspective because I thought I had to talk only about the American <laughs> system. And I'm, 
I have some notes about uh, Latin American and Mexico. Um, mostly let me emphasize that for me, it's very interesting and important the importance and uh, interest and support of IFES to study, to research, and to help uh, democracies with this topic of challenges and disputes and designing the, the better model for, for different uh, di democracies and context. Um, IFES has published uh, dozens of, of books and organized seminars. Um, uh, it's very, very important because uh, during these uh, events, uh, mainly the effort is concentrated only on administrative uh, issues or the organization of the election, of the observation of elections. But not always there is a special attention on the uh, disputes and ta challenges of the election. And this is a perfect time because uh, the United States had their election last night, so we can prepare, hopefully not for a lot of, of challenges, but some of them should, should be, or maybe. And it's, it's very important to, to discuss and to have the opportunity to know uh, about different uh, models and, and systems. Um, as you, of course, know, know uh, last uh, century, democracy has a significant, significantly expanded uh, worldwide. Uh, African, Latin American, Eastern European uh, countries, and lately, of course, the Arab countries. They have developed uh, competitive uh, systems, competitive political parties, but also independent uh, authorities and institutions. Uh, it's, we can consider that uh, in these regions, uh, under substantial democratic uh, evolutions, the role of the electoral institutions, both the administrative and jurisdictional institution, is of mainly uh, importance. Um, these historical processes, and I will focus on Latin America, uh, require not only high levels of performance of the electoral institutions, also the capacity of resolve complaints and disputes. Even when you have uh, well-organized elections, if you don't have the capacity of solving, of solve, sorry, uh, complaints and disputes, it can affect the legitimacy of all the democratic process. When the electoral complaints are not fairly and rapidly processed, and I stress rapidly processed, political, political actors' compliance with the rule of law may diminish and legitimacy of election can be put at risk. This can even represent, uh, I think, or a significant uh, setback when democracies are still fragile. So, having this in mind, uh, Latin American countries developed strong electoral dispute resolution systems in order to strengthen and support their transition to democracy. As you, I'm sure, remember, Latin American countries were most important uh, ingredient of what Professor Huntington called the third wave of democracies. In 1977, only Costa Rica, Venezuela, and perhaps Colombia were, cons were consolidated uh, democracies. In a sea of military dictatorships, unique party systems, and restricted, restricted election systems. It was until 1994 when other 15 Latin American countries uh, consolidated deep transformations in their political systems. In order to achieve this, these uh, countries in Latin America required solid electoral institutions capable of both things, organizing free and democratic elections, but also deliver electoral justice to all political actors. 
And this is the most accepted account of the unique electoral dispute resolution systems that has been created in Latin America. Unlike uh, other legal frameworks, Latin American countries have particularly pioneered a combination of institutional practices that combine election administration responsibilities with an out, sorry, acknowledgement of an obligation to provide for election adjudication mechanisms. A specialized electoral courts with functional independence respond to the need to warranty the jurisdiction nature, nature of judgments on the elections and detach this process from the political assemblies without being exposed to political pressures of political parties. This is a model, a characterized model of Latin American uh, democracies and uh, during the transitions. But moreover, the model implemented in Latin America made possible and an essential, an essential condition for democratic transitions. The protection of elections from the influence of external authorities, branches, other branches, mainly executive branch, and also from other authorities, administrative authorities. So it, it was a kind of protection from other powers within or inside an authoritarian or a totalitarian regime. Basically, the model envisages the creation of independent courts within the judicial branch or completely independent from the three branches of government, and vested with the power to give final resolution to electoral disputes. The validity of their judgments or decisions it's not open to review by any administrative or legislative body. Sometimes within the judiciary or the constitutional court or Supreme Court, if, if they are not the final instance, but not from other uh, branches of government. It is possible to identify, identify two major groups. One group, is a, a specialized court responsible for both the organization of the elections and the electoral dispute uh, resolution. This is the case, for example, uh, Brazil and Costa Rica. While in Brazil, its final decisions may be challenged on constitutional grounds before the Supreme Court, and in Costa Rica, its decisions are not subject to appeal or any kind of revision. The second major group has a system constituted by independent and separated electoral bodies. One is entrusted with the administrative uh, aspects of the election, such as the organization of the, of the elections, while others decide only upon the challenges placed against the administrative electoral decisions and political rights. This uh, dual system is implemented in countries in which the appellate body is an autonomous body or part of the judiciary. Uh, we have examples as uh, Chile and Ecuador, or in those which is part of the judicial branch. Sorry, Chile and Ecuador, it's an autonomous court and in Venezuela and Mexico, it, the electoral courts are part of the judiciary. And I would like to uh, exchange and to uh, talk, give you some experiences of Mexico uh, electoral court. And one of the, Mexico is one of the most representative examples of this uh, Latin American model perhaps because it is one of the last countries in the region that have achieved the transition to democracy. But it is also, I have to accept that, it is also the country that has developed the most complex set of rules regarding electo electoral matters. We have more than 10 articles in our constitution which deals with elections and we have an electoral code 
with more than 350 articles. And we uh, repeat this model in each of our 31 states and the federal districts with local within the local constitution, local electoral laws, and we also have local electoral authorities, which uh, decisions can be reviewed by the electoral federal courts. In fact, uh, one of the most uh, widespread explanation about the Mexican transition argues that this process, the, demo the democratic transition, happened as a result of the creation and development of electoral, strong, and independent institutions. So it was the first stage that we had to face, and after that, we could transit uh, to uh, democracy. In Mexico, the distribution of competences is uh, it's that at the federal level, there is the Federal Electoral Institute. It's the administrative electoral body. It deals with the organization of the, of the elections. Uh, and there is the Electoral Court as a specialized body of the federal judicial branch. At the beginning, the Electoral Court was an independent body, but uh, there was a reform in 1996 which translated the court into the judiciary. Uh, the uh, Congress uh, explained and decided that because or in order to uh, give strength to the electoral court within the uh, judiciary. But the Supreme Court doesn't review any of the decisions of the electoral court. So it's like a judiciary with uh, two heads. I didn't say a monster with two heads. I only said the judiciary <laughs> with uh, two, two heads. Uh, but also the administrative body, IFE, is responsible of apply administrative sanctions, uh, continually decide upon appeals concerning propaganda, access to media, budget expenditure. Moreover, the court has the power to rule against the, up, sorry, upon the challenges against all the administrative body resolutions. Uh, the last constitutional amendment, remember that we love constitutional amendments, more than 500, I think, in Mexico. In 2006, there was another constitutional amendment which established that electoral court had also the power to the declare the inapplicability of electoral laws if they were proven to be in conflict with the constitutions, but only with effects on specific cases. So the Supreme Court, um, uh, the, the abstract constitutional, constitutional control system remains as a power vested in the Supreme Court. So the only competence of the Supreme Court on electoral matters, it's to review the constitutionality of the electoral uh, law, the whole body of the electoral law, or only some uh, articles when it is uh, newly approved. But the electoral court can uh, declare the inapplicability of a specific electoral law or article when it's solving a case. Uh, and also we have a special prosecutor's office for electoral crimes, uh, but it is a part of the executive branch with the responsibility to deal with electoral crimes such uh, as vote buying and other uh, offenses. And um, to finish with the, my intervention, I just want to tell you the types of disputes that the electoral court is competent to decide upon any challenge presented. First of all, we are a permanent body, so we, we, we solve a challenges not only during electoral processes, so it can be a, without an electoral process in, in course. A, we uh, solve the challenges presented a, against presidential elections, against a, legislative elections, we are the last instance uh, 
uh, against acts and, acts and resolutions of local elections as well. So we review the decisions of local electoral tribunals and institutes. And I'm very glad that we have here uh, representatives from local institutes of different states of Mexico. And we also solve challenges against acts and resolutions of political parties. This is very interesting. We protect the citizens' political rights. The Electoral Court solved challenges uh, uh, against the violation of political rights of vote, be voted, political association, and we also deal with internal dis disputes within political parties. Thousands of disputes of internal political parties go before the Electoral Court. Um, also, uh, we solve the labor disputes and differences among the Federal Electoral Institute and its public officials. So everything which smells electoral go to the Federal Electoral Court. Of course, as I mentioned, there are local instances. Not everything is challenged. So resolutions of electoral authorities are definitive, but if they are challenged, the electoral court solve uh, this. Um, and you mentioned some, some principles. I think independence is of the most uh, importance uh, of the organization or the institution and its members. The appointment of the, of the justices or judges it's very important in Mexico, are nominated by the Supreme Court and elected by the two-thirds of the Senate. Presidency of the Electoral Court is uh, designated by its own members. The budget of the Electoral Courts need to be approved by Federal Congress, but the executive don't interfere. So we present through the Supreme Court, but actually the President of the Supreme Court doesn't change our proposal and goes through the legislative. Wage of the judges, we earn an identical wage to the one received by the justices of the Supreme Court. And there is a prohibition to occupy any public office in government whose election they decide open two years after that we finished our, um, our period. Advantages and disadvantages, I think you mentioned the, the most important. Uh, it's an expensive structure, of course. There are different uh, ways of solving this. Uh, but uh, because it's a body, a permanent body, at least at its, at its basic structure, it could be uh, very expensive. And also the possibility in this model, the possibility of contradictions uh, within a uh, criteria of the Supreme Court and the uh, Electoral Court because we deal with human rights, both of us. And the advantages, celerity, specialized body allowed the establishment of procedures that are appropriate for an efficient electoral system. We, the Electoral Court in Mexico, solve cases in an average of 19 days. Uh, which uh, while ordinary courts need months or years. And we solve all cases before they take office. So they don't take office if, if we, I mean, we, we have to solve before they take, off, take office. Legitim legitimacy, um, I think that an independent electoral court may build its legitimacy and moral standing in order um, to resist pressure imposed by government, political parties, and the media, of course. Uh, protect judiciary, even that we are inside the judiciary, uh, we, are, we are the specialized uh, body. Uh, and I think this also safeguard the judiciary, the Supreme Court, of political issues and, and pressures. Uh, flexibility, I think more than flexibility is progressiveness. I mean, we, we are dealing with, very, uh, in a, with a very dynamic uh, area of protection of political rights. So we have to be progressive 
in order to protect these rights. And compliance, uh, unlike administrative justice in electoral courts in, Mexi in Mexico, all of the decisions, 100% of the decisions are fully complied. This maintains elections under the, the rule of law. Um, and I hope that I've been clear enough in stating that there is no such thing as the best electoral dispute resolution system model. What you may have is a model that best adapts for the specific current historical and political conditions of a country. But I wanted to share Mexican model and Latin American experience. Thank you very much. I, I think that um, I've had the opportunity to, to go to Mexico and look at the system there, and there's so many things that um, all of us could learn from them in regards to case management, the independence of the court, and many, many other things, the voter education that they do. Um, but as I said, uh, it comes at a cost. Uh, also, I would say the, the speed, the due process protections, and the timeliness. Um, but it definitely comes with a cost. So when we're, we're weighing these options in the countries in which we all work, I think these are some of the things we have to consider. Um, I think to go from an extreme of a specialized court to um, the example of a U.S. And the, and the system of using the existing court system, Judge Thunheim, um, we'll go over that. Thank you, Chad, and good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here. Uh, I hope that this has been a good experience observing elections here in the United States. Uh, it's been uh, an interesting time for all of us, uh, watching the approach and then uh, staying up uh, all hours last night to, to hear the results. I'm going to talk uh, briefly this morning about uh, the use of regular courts uh, to adjudicate uh, and resolve electoral complaints. Uh, first of all, I have to say that the United States system, as you probably uh, know, is, is layered with complexities, and it's very difficult to uh, to give a basic system that is in place in every one of the states in the United States. We have a federalism system, so we have federal courts, of which I am a judge in federal court. Uh, it's a court of limited jurisdiction, although election uh, matters do come before me uh, from time to time. I stayed in my chambers last night until polls closed in the state of Minnesota because uh, most elections, there's someone who comes with a complaint to try to get resolved at the last minute. But our state courts, uh, by and large, handle most of uh, the electoral issues, uh, complaint issues in this country. Uh, they have broader jurisdiction. And uh, as you, I don't know that we have too many uh, cases that are coming out of this election. You likely read that there were teams of lawyers ready to uh, run into jurisdictions where there were problems. My friend Mr. Young was probably on most of those teams, and he can talk about that. Uh, but largely, I think we passed through this election so far without uh, too many difficulties. But our model in the United States, despite the, the differences among the different states' approaches to handling uh, electoral uh, complaints, largely resolves around a model that uses the regular court system to resolve complaints. Uh, most states, I think, in the United States use what I would call a bit of a blended system, which utilizes both courts and election officials uh, to resolve both pre-election and election day and post-election complaints. The most simple uh, form of the system, which is probably present to a great extent in most of our states, sets up a responsible elections official. This is a person who administers elections. At the state level, it is usually the Secretary of State, which have elections duties. They are unrelated completely to the U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, but uh, most states have a Secretary of State who is the top elections official. They typically will make initial decisions concerning electoral complaints. And we have a system at the local level in counties or municipalities or cities uh, where there is a senior elections official 
whose job it is to oversee the elections process, administer the elections process, and at least initially resolve disputes. These are the officials who get the first complaints when something is going wrong. And so when a complaint has been made, once a decision has been made by the elections official, um, or a decision has not been made, because that often happens as well, uh, or there's no time for an elections official to make a competent decision, uh, the aggrieved party then generally has a right to uh, file a complaint in the regular court system, which alleges a violation of the applicable electoral code. So that's really where the first interaction with the court occurs. The regular courts become then uh, fact finders and they issue a decision. And the parties usually have the right to appeal that decision to an appellate court or to a state supreme court. And this is similar to in some jurisdictions where a constitutional court has the right to review uh, decisions that are made by elections officials. Now on the federal side, if a constitutional right has been violated or alleged to have been violated, say a violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act, which guarantees uh, to all individuals a, a right to vote, then the party can go directly to a federal court and file a complaint alleging this constitutional violation. I know that makes it a little bit more complex and harder to understand, uh, but generally speaking, uh, courts have equitable powers uh, to impose temporary relief when there has been an adequate showing of a constitutional violation. Now, I want to spend most of my time here discussing the pros and cons of this approach, and then I want to give you some, a few examples of how states have, uh, have modified this process to suit their own needs. So there's some problems, of course, with utilizing a regular court structure uh, for resolving electoral complaints. Uh, in many places, regular courts often can act too slowly uh, or cannot react as quickly as necessary to resolve complaints. Usually, elections complaints require a speedy resolution. And if courts are set up to resolve issues uh, on a speedy basis, then this is okay. Uh, the biggest complaint about regular courts uh, involved in elections matters is that regular courts don't ordinarily possess the necessary expertise or the training in elections matters and surely don't have the experience that an elections management body or an independent electoral court possesses. Uh, so this is, this is probably the largest concern about broad utilization of the regular court system. Uh, also, regular court judges may approach all cases equally and not immediately recognize that a case brought before them is frivolous or has no basis for it and should be uh, uh, dismissed promptly. Uh, regular courts often have large caseloads and case backlogs that sometimes prevent them from uh, hearing an elections complaint uh, quickly. And regular courts uh, often have not developed the kind of expedited court rules or procedures that can be used to speedily handle a complaint. Also an issue which generally is not a problem in the United States but could be a problem elsewhere is the question about, about whether the regular court system commands the respect of the people. Do the people believe that the regular court system is independent, uh, competent, um, mature? Uh, do people naturally accept the decisions of the regular court system? Uh, are there uh, corruption issues? These are questions that need to be uh, asked. But then turning to the other side, there's often, I think, great value in including regular courts in the dispute resolution process. Uh, the, uh, the cost issue, uh, which we talked about earlier here, is obviously a main issue there because it doesn't cost extra for regular courts to handle election matters. Uh, international standards uh, establish uh, a right of judicial review, uh, and that's usually done by an independent court of law uh, to protect human rights. And voting is, of course, a right that is to be protected uh, throughout the world. 
Judges are often uh, trained uh, to resolve complicated legal disputes and know how to utilize due process procedures. These are procedures that are very familiar to the lawyers who may be bringing complaints in court and to sophisticated parties who challenge election procedures or election results. So they know what to expect. They, uh, lawyers go to court every day in this country and they know how courts will handle uh, issues. Uh, the regular court system also is not part of the busy election management system that has an enormous administrative responsibility throughout the entire electoral cycle. So they're not burdened with all the extra duties that an electoral management board might be burdened with during the course of uh, an election. And I think if there are constitutional issues that are raised, constitutional issues are best resolved by regular courts if a system permits a regular court to look at a constitutional issue or a constitutional court whose special expertise is indeed interpreting the Constitution and interpreting the Constitution for elections is part of that. Um, generally speaking, judges in the United States are uninvolved at least in partisan politics. Uh, so the public here uh, does understand that their role in the system does bring an independence and a detached nonpartisan view to disputes. Uh, judges, while they may have their own views, uh, do not have an interest in the outcome of a dispute. They are there to resolve the dispute fairly based on the law and not on their own viewpoints or who they want to win. Also, I think the regular court system is probably uh, better able to detect true fraud and potential criminal charges associated with an election and thus uh, an ability to easily reject uh, unsubstantiated claims of fraud. Uh, fraud is claimed frequently during the course of an election and oftentimes there are no, there's no basis to these charges and courts uh, can quickly recognize that probably more quickly than uh, an electoral management board. Also, regular court judges uh, in most parts of the world uh, routinely apply standards and they understand how to apply burdens of proof, which of course, as uh, Chad mentioned, are important uh, for a fair system for resolving uh, electoral disputes. Uh, judges in a regular court system routinely uh, assess the reliability and admissibility of evidence. There may be all kinds of claims that are associated with an election complaint that may not have any basis, that may not be, uh, have any evidentiary value, and judges, I think, in a regular court system are probably more accustomed to understanding that. And I think also in many countries, judges do command the respect of people and are viewed as neutral arbiters and not uh, representatives of political parties, which can undermine a decision. Uh, so to, uh, to get at and to ameliorate some of the deficiencies, which I think we can all see in a regular court uh, adjudication model, uh, for some types of electoral issues, states have established what I mentioned earlier is this blended uh, model of dispute resolution using both court and administrative structures. Most states, uh, by law or by court rule, have established firm rules to expedite cases in the regular court system and to move them quickly. And I'll give you just a couple examples of, as I finish. Uh, for example, for a recount of a close election, many states have uh, given the authority first to a canvassing board who will certify the results of an election. That canvassing board in many states will include judges from the regular court system because, again, because of their expertise in looking at these matters. Uh, then the decisions of a canvassing board can then be appealed to the regular court system, and in that way, uh, uh, there can be ultimately a judicial decision if there are close issues to be resolved. And some states have uh, what we can describe as an electoral complaint commission, which is short of an electoral court and outside of an electoral management group. It can be a citizen body or a body that includes judges 
that is really established solely for the purpose of handling election complaints and challenges. It's quasi-judicial in that respect, but it is uh, the, the first go at, uh, at handling an issue. These commissions have no roles in the administration of elections, and that distinguishes them from electoral management bodies, and their decisions usually always can be appealed to a judicial body like the state Supreme Court. Though they can blend expertise in election disputes and not be a permanent body so that they're not as costly and they can act quickly while allowing the electoral management bodies to manage the process. So this is what some states have done to try to blend these processes. Um, for resolution of pre-election issues, which often have a very short deadline, there are usually statutory provisions in states that require expedition of electoral complaints and, and can prove that courts on occasion can indeed move more quickly when a deadline is approaching. A good example here is in Minnesota, my state, which uh, empowers our state Supreme Court to handle election-related uh, disputes on a very fast timeline. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I was the lawyer representing the top elections official in the state, we had an unusual situation. A week or so before the election, the Republican candidate for governor withdrew. Now, the statute says that, that in that case, the political party, the Republican Party, is to choose a new candidate. Well, the, the party declined to choose a new candidate because the body that would have chosen it was dominated by one faction, and they did not really want to have that kind of a person uh, be the nominee at the very end. So the election official had to decide, who am I going to put on the ballot? So our decision was that we put on the person who finished second in the primary election. And that, of course, was challenged instantly. So we had a case that the complaint was filed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Our briefs were due at 7 o'clock in the morning. We had an argument at 10 o'clock before our state Supreme Court, and the decision was released at 3 o'clock that afternoon. So we went through an entire cycle of a case before the state Supreme Court in about 23 hours' time because, of course, we had to act quickly. So that's an example of what states have done to try to make sure they can respond quickly when there are cases. Um, another point is that courts sometimes are reluctant to act when an elections official who has expertise has not yet acted. Oftentimes, we as judges would like to see the administrative official who has the expertise make an initial decision so that we can assess whether that decision was correct or not. So sometimes courts may ask parties to exhaust their administrative remedies before an elections official first, and when there is time, uh, this is a good way to proceed. So then the court is reviewing the actions of an elections official rather than hearing a claim uh, from the start. And so, in closing, I think although this model focuses heavily and appropriately on the use of the regular court system to resolve electoral models, uh, in my view, the model can clearly be improved with uh, some modifications, and the two primary ones are uh, requiring an elections management official or an election complaint commission uh, to make a decision first, even if it's a very quick decision and then give the parties the right then to take that decision to court uh, with the normal burdens of proof. Uh, oftentimes, complaints can be resolved without the need for an appeal and resolved very quickly by an administrative official. But under this model, and the model we practice here, the judiciary really always has the final decision through oversight of the process and through appeals, but oftentimes it is the final decision that is based heavily on what the uh, expertise uh, gives them from the electoral system. And then when regular courts are handled an issue, I think it's very important to have strict rules in place for timing, both for when fact-finding is required by the court uh, and, uh, and e also for times when only a legal issue needs to be resolved. And this can be done by statute or by a procedural code, a special procedural code for electoral complaints. Thank you. Uh, Judge Dunheim.
introduce. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, it's always an honor to work with IFAS, and it's particularly an honor to be here in the Kennedy Caucus Room, where both Jack Kennedy and Bob Kennedy started their presidential elections. Uh, this has been a traditional place for Democratic candidates, uh, including when Joe Biden uh, ran for president, uh, to begin the campaign. So it's a great place for us to meet when it, we come to discussing uh, elections, uh, in addition to all the historic values uh, that Bill talked about earlier. Uh, it's, it's, this is an exciting room to be in when you know that the next President of the United States is starting his or her campaign uh, here. Tomorrow, probably. <laughs> uh, it was last night, uh, Jack, but um, <laughs> we are already starting the 2016 campaign. Uh, uh, on behalf of Mark Warner, uh, candidate for president, uh, I'd like to ask that you send your contributions in early. Uh, this message is brought to you by the Mark Warner campaign because we believe in America. So if you thought that you got a break from the campaign ads, uh, live it up today and tomorrow. But it is a great honor to be here with, with the preeminent uh, body in the world that is dealing with election dispute resolution. Uh, obviously, our goals uh, are fourfold. First, uh, we always want to pursue fairness. Second, uh, we always want to pursue efficiency, particularly in elections. Elections continue whether we like it or not in almost all instances. Third, credibility matters. And last, finality. No matter what you think of what the Supreme Court did, it did in 2000 here in the United States, you can say without doubt that on December 12, 2000, we had a final decision. Having represented one of the candidates who was not President of the United States at the time and didn't become President of the United States, the finality stings, but it leads to I believe, an establishment of uh, democracy that can proceed. Now, for an understanding of the, particularly the U.S. election dispute resolution process, we start with the primacy, that is the importance in the first instance of state agencies. All elections in the United States, including presidential elections, the election we just went through yesterday, are regulated by state electoral boards, either under the authority of the Secretary of State or independent state boards of elections. This is a distinction that has some importance. Most Secretaries of States are people who have been elected, and most times they ran not to be Secretary of State, but because it's a stepping stone to the governorship. And they usually are competing against another state official the attorney general or an insurance commissioner. The attorney generals have their own association called the National Association of Attorneys General, also known as the National Association of Aspiring Governors. So politics matters. And the partisanship becomes a crucial part of our analysis of what state agencies do and don't do. State boards of elections can either be independent bodies within the, within the state government, or they can be a subset of the Office of Secretary of State. Uh, following 2000 in Florida, uh, and then later uh, in 2004 in Ohio, we have seen the importance of administrative expertise independent of politically elected officials. Because our state agencies, electoral boards, are the principal electoral management bodies in the United States. And they are the primary dispute resolvers as administrative agencies. The actual election, including what happened yesterday, are conducted by local, that is county, city level officials that are formed in local electoral boards, like territorial uh, boards. They have the real responsibility. So, for example, in Virginia, 
the election went on yesterday. We have 132 cities and counties. Each of them had an independent electoral board. What one electoral board does may not be consistent with what another one does. We have populous areas, northern Virginia to Richmond, our capital, over to the beach, the Democratic area. It's the most populous area. It elects the president. And that seemed for one of the parties, uh, and I won't reveal what, what my propensities are, but for one of the parties, uh, that was a very successful combination uh, in ensuring that Virginia uh, went to Obama. Uh, and I will not tell you that whether I'm happy about that or sad about it, but had it gone the other way, I wouldn't be here. Um, because we would still be fighting it out. Um, so this important, what is important about this is to understand that now we have local administrative agencies who are decision makers appeals generally go to state courts. Uh, I've probably been involved in 100 election cases. Uh, I've seen federal judges uh, in rare occasions. And twice the federal judges said, uh, Mr. Young, you should return to state court under a doctrine called Younger versus Harris. The other one, um, we all suggested in Florida that no one would ever go to federal court, and it was a state court matter, and I think you all realize that it was the Supreme Court of the United States, a federal court, uh, that decided the, the case. But generally, cases go to the state courts, but only rarely. Only rarely. The decision maker is the administrative body, first at the local level and then at the state level. And this is important. Because one of the things that we do during an election is we actually encourage uh, complaints, incidences to be brought to the local body, to the state body, and we do that through the political parties. Yesterday, for example, the Democratic Party of Virginia uh, received over 4,500 complaints across the Commonwealth, which has 8 million people. Um, it has a voting out turnout of roughly 60 percent. We've heard earlier about the rolls, so you never know exactly is that 60 percent of the people who should be voting or 60 percent of the people who are on the rolls. Uh, dead people very rarely uh, vote anymore. Uh, we've gotten through our religious experience of raising the dead uh, so that we are talking about real voters. But think about this for a minute. 4,500 complaints brought from the opening of polls at 6 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. All, all of those complaints have been resolved. There is nothing left to do today. And the way we have done that, <laughs> well, I remember I didn't tell you who I, who I was supporting. Had it gone the other way, there would be 4,500 complaints in our state courts right now. Um, and I do re realize that every time we do that, I've learned the lesson of get paid up front. <laughs> um, but what is important is to recognize this model of a political party with civil society organizations resolving complaints in real time. And what are we talking about? We're first talking about solving complaints through education. Many of the com complaints that arise are simply because officers of election uh, make mistakes. Remember, we're, we do not do elections every day. Well, there are very few countries that do elections every day. So this is not something that is in our regular routine of things to think about. So our first task is always education. And education gets rid of many of the disputes. Is someone supposed to be able to vote? Where do they vote? The second is that we actually can have the state board or a local board uh, instruct a poll worker that is an officer of election in the polls, what was the right procedure? We can capture where errors are made and have the correction made at the time. We also can negotiate uh, resolutions. This is sort of on the fly, quick mediation negotiation of a dispute that all happens in about half an hour. 
Our goal is to resolve disputes so that we can allow all legitimate voters to vote. Remember, if the election's over and a dispute is still out there and we determine that someone who wasn't allowed to vote should vote, what do we do? Well, there's no remedy. The remedy is to get the person to vote if they're entitled to vote on election day. This is like a river. If any of you have been on a river, when it goes downstream, very rarely does, does it come back. If you, if you fall out of your boat, I suggest that you go to the shore rather than wait for your boat to come back. It's the same with the votes. So the parties are important, but resolution of disputes is also critically important. But very quickly, campaign finance. Uh, again, most campaign finance is done on the state level, with the exception that, as many of you have already seen in your rounds, uh, the Federal Election Commission regulates presidential, Senate, House of Representatives, Congress uh, funding. This is really a disclosure process. There is a, a exception to the disclosure, and that is uh, that the First Amendment uh, in the United States takes a great deal of prominence in political debate. And under a case called Citizens United, uh, corporations and others may give and contribute and have ads uh, that don't need to be disclosed as their sources uh, because of the First Amendment rights. As long as they don't say elect or not elect uh, an individual, uh, they clearly um, are permissible. Quickly, and I know that time is, is of the essence, uh, some of the issues that were before our electoral agencies yesterday, uh, voter registration, you know, is someone registered? Um, voter ID, we've heard a great deal about this issue of do you need to have voter identification? Uh, and I think for anyone other than someone from the United States, uh, you would be puzzled why this is an issue. It is an issue because um, our history has been simply not to ask for identification. You went to your polling place, you knew everyone. You said to your uncle and or even to your wife, I am here. My wife probably looked at me and said, who the hell are you? Um, but we didn't need identification. We've now gone to a system of identification. There are a lot of problems with it. Uh, there's no evidence that we are solving a fraud problem because there's not, there's not any evidence of fraud whatsoever. Uh, so we are, we are still struggling with what kind of identification. Uh, litigation uh, over the last uh, couple of months has proved that if it's too stringent, uh, it is a, a disenfranchisement because we don't have universal identification. 20 million people in the United States don't have a form of identification at all. And they are seniors. If you no longer drive, you don't have a driver's license. The poor. And particularly in the South, many, many of the people were born at home. You don't have a birth certificate. Early and absentee voting and counting issues have become uh, the new um, sort of area of conflict. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of the people will vote early absentee. In two states, that's all they do is mail. Voting machines, we use basically two types of machines, optical scan, precinct count. Uh, and our touch screens, they continue to be issues, although we are, we are slowly resolving the technology issues. You would think in a democracy uh, of the type of the United States with some idea of having uh, an idea about the prominence of technology, we could do better. And we simply don't, in large part because of what uh, Jack talked about, and that is that we have a federal system. Uh, ID, the ID rules, if you look at a map of the United States, uh, you will see that they are all over the map. That is, they are all different. The rules in Virginia are different from the rules in Pennsylvania. Uh, the rules in Virginia are certainly different than the rules in Minnesota. In fact, most people in Virginia don't even know where Minnesota is. Uh, and I think most of us think it's part of Canada. And I'm not sure why it isn't. but. A couple comments very, very briefly, because we are running out of time, uh, on the uh, presidential election. As, as, as you have heard over and over again, the presidential election in the United States is determined by the states. 
and you all of a sudden get the idea of the primacy of the states. So we have the Electoral College. Uh, it is neither about college nor really about elections, but it is a historical event. Um, for all other candidates, we really have the, the first past the post based on the popular vote. But remember, in 2000, Al Gore won the popular vote and lost the election. We could well have, it will not happen, I believe, but we could well have a fact where President Obama, I almost said President Romney, and that would be a mistake, President Obama will get the Electoral College, I mean, te technically, historically only, will get, the, will get the Electoral College, he'll get 300 Electoral College votes, um, and still could lose the popular vote. The popular vote is very, very close between the governor and the, and the president, the electoral vote is, is somewhat uh, different. Remedies available to unsuccessful candidates. Generally, they are a recount, has to be close. When we talk about a recount, we mean recounting the votes, taking a look at the machine totals. If you thought that there was a massive fraud that affected the outcome of the election, the efficacy of the election, it is a contest. Generally, contests are resolved by the legislative body, so if it is a of which the candidate is to be elected. So if it's a United States Senator, that dispute would be resolved in this very room, ultimately. Now we go through state courts, it goes through, could go through the federal courts. In the case that uh, came out of Minnesota, even though the Supreme Court of Minnesota in the Frank and Coleman race was involved, the ultimate decision maker would have been the United States Senate. The House goes over the House, um, that is the same in most state instances. If you're a state senator, or state uh, representative, or a member of the House of Delegates, the ultimate decider in a contest is the legislative body. Well, that also tells you that politics matters. And that is sort of the theme, is politics matters, but we, within that context, can have a dispute resolution process that is administrative, it's cooperative and collaborative with the parties, it is fair, it is efficient, uh, it is generally final, and we find that it has a great deal of credibility because it resolves disputes today. If, if one were a young lawyer starting out in the election practice area, I would tell them do not believe that you will make your fortune on post-election disputes in the United States. Get it up front and get it before the election. Thank you, we, I know we're late, thank you. Thank you, Jack. I think that um, uh, hopefully that this discussion today talked about some international principles that we can all look at, gave us some examples in regards to um, an independent elect uh, tribunal like in Mexico the U.S. system and what happened yesterday um, and the system generally in the United States. Um, so I hope we covered the ground that we wanted to. And with that, um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a very brief question. Um, particularly, we had three different versions the EFA version and the mixed version and also a special uh, court, uh, uh, I mean the mixed version means uh, electoral management body, also adjudicating at the same time, existing court doing uh, the work of uh, adjudicating the electoral disputes. Uh, with regards to our experience, uh, unlike the US uh, already started a uh, you know, political campaign from yesterday, you know that there is a date for elections in four years' time on the first uh, Tuesday of the first month, Sunday. Uh, you can start a uh, political campaign from now, but then in our part of the world, we have, uh, um, we have to, we, we should wait until the government announces the date of elections or the election commission announces the date, which is not a fixed date. So, during the time of, after the announcement of election, then the uh, election commission or electoral management body has power uh, or is empowered to adjudicate the electoral disputes, whereas in other, or other time of the year, from the time of the registration to the, until the time of the counting of votes and the result, 
declaration, uh, we have uh, problems. And uh, any time that uh, complaint is lost to the court, existing court, the existing court sometimes takes more than the tenure of the person who has been elected, and then the elected person will enjoy the full terms without getting any verdict of the court in, the, in our part of the world, particularly in my country, Nepal, also. So what would you suggest for us to take and to uh, do justice in the electoral dispute resolution process? Thank you. Let me make sure that I, I uh, understand the question. And the question is that um, there, there could be a complaint that's existing while someone's in office, mm -hmm. and it'll last. Uh, and what can we do about it? I think, um, Justice Annalise, if you want to talk about how they do that in Mexico, and then. Can I answer in Spanish? Sure. Mm -hmm. I prefer to answer in Spanish, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> Already, the three people who have participated here, we have mentioned that there have to be certain expeditious measures and terms and times, that is, for settling all electoral disputes and challenges. And I think that both systems, both that of Mexico and of some Latin American countries, and even in the United States, offer that, in that those decisions that have to be made urgently, that is through summary proceedings, need to be done in that way, expeditiously, so as to be able to really offer access to justice. And that, as I said, it be expeditious and timely. This has to be part of the laws and of regulations. I also think that um, in many places we've talked about, and I think in Mexico, that, that um, the person can't take office if there's still a complaint that's, that's lodged. Um, so it has to be resolved before they can take their office. Um, yes. Jack? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an intriguing problem uh, because finality is important as well as fairness. Now, recall what you've seen today in the presidential election is only the unofficial results. Every state will have a canvas uh, and then a certification of the results uh, will, will take about a month. Uh, we're starting the canvas today, but official results will not be announced until uh, later in the year. Uh, in fact, the Congress of the United States will meet to accept the results in the beginning of, of January. So we have some time uh, to consider the matter. But the office makes a big difference. If it is for the President of the United States, if it is for a governor or a leader, uh, that makes, I think, uh, important that we have a final, final decision. Now, if it's for the United States Senate, which we have 100 United States senators, we might tolerate uh, a process where it takes, in the Minnesota case, took seven months. Uh, we've had other Senate races that have taken a couple of years. Now, one of the things we don't do in those instances is we don't seat uh, the winner or the, or the possible winner until we get resolution. But one out of 100, I think you can tolerate. You cannot tolerate us waiting uh, to figure out who the President of the United States is. That's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court rightly decided Bush versus Gore on December 12, 2000, because we thought that having a president of the United States in office was a good thing. Whether it was or not eight years later is a different matter. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm from Chile, from the electoral court in Chile, and I'd like to ask a question to the judge. The first one is, if I understood correctly, you said that where you work, there had been 4,500 complaints yesterday, and that they all been settled. 
up to now, that is within 24 hours, but you had said that if the other candidate had won, you would still be arguing. Maybe it was something that I misunderstood, but could you really explain what you meant? And my second question is, my attention was drawn to the fact that when you made reference to a candidate to, to the Senate, that if there is some kind of problem with the election of a candidate to the Senate, that that is resolved by the House itself, or by the Senate itself, rather. I think in the case of my country, and we have had an electoral court in 1925, it is the one that decides any kind of jurisdictional dispute that exists regarding a person being elected or not. Because I think that the upper or lower house, and that's why we have this federal tribu tribunal, the upper and lower houses would decide who would be the winner depending on what they wanted and depending on who the majority was. So do you think that that is the best way to proceed? Or is it something that only happens in the United States? Ah, and before concluding, I would like to thank IFIS for having given me the opportunity to participate in this very, very important meeting or meetings that we have done in the last few days. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first, thank you. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the, as to the first, the 4,500, uh, they got resolved. And, and to tell you the truth, uh, had we been on the other end of it, they would still be resolved. Um, the, um, the dispute resolution process works because uh, our, our first and real obligation is the, to the primacy of the right to vote. And getting a person to vote on election day is the only way to protect that. Uh, as to our system for, the, for dispute resolution uh, in contested elections, uh, it becomes fairly complex. Uh, in a recount for, for a legislative seat, uh, you usually have uh, a series of trials in the state court system, uh, usually decided by the Supreme Court of that state, but the ultimate decider is still the legislative body. That is because the, in the United States, the qualifications and acceptance of members is left to the legislative body. Now, in, in recounts for a gubernatorial race, generally those are decided by the state courts, and that state court decision is final and not reviewable. Contests, however, can go to the state body. So there's a great distinction between a recount, where we're recounting the ballots, and a contest which raises factual issues. Is it the best system? No. Uh, it's not the best system because politics plays a very important role. If you are a Republican candidate for the United States Senate today, what do you think your chances are that you will actually, in a very, very close election, prevail if you went to the United States Senate, which is democratic. So the system, it doesn't work well. Uh, there are better ways to do recounts and contests than the way we do it. Uh, it's an awkward process. Uh, it's not a particularly efficient process. It's not a particularly fair process. It's only fair to the winner as he or she perceives it. <laughs> Just one additional point to uh, Mr. Young's comments on that on issue. We have this strange concept in this country that a legislative body is the final judge of who should be its membership. That's existed from the start. I think there were irregularities and this principle is, is, is firmly established. However, um, most legislative bodies, if there is a legal process that's followed and someone is certified the winner as part of the legal process, then a legislative body usually doesn't disrupt that and change to the other person because there would be a political price to pay for doing something like that because the voters don't like that kind of thing happening. So for the most part, it seems to work, even though I agree with Jack that it is kind of a strange system. 
uh, where you really allow a legislative body to be the final judge of who sits uh, in its chairs in its chamber. Yes, what I just wanted to add is that in Latin American countries, we have the same system of the, we call auto-qualification of, of Congress, but we migrated to jurisdictional qualification, but we had exactly the same, and mainly Chile was one of the first countries which established this constitutional um, electoral tribunal, which uh, does the qualification of uh, legislative uh, elections. I think we'll have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Oh, two more, okay, two more questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I can, you can see who's in charge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I must admit that uh, I'm Stefanos Dafuang from the Nigerian Electoral Commission. Uh, I, I was very impressed about the way uh, results were coming out. I noted that it was not the electoral management body that was uh, relating and collating these results. Uh, so the trust as a basis for the success of these elections, certainly it's uh, very important. And uh, I wish we could have that uh, in my, my country. Um, now, the... One area of uh, confusion, though, that I need further clarification is um, the electoral colleges determine the, who wins the elections. But I noticed that in each state, once you have the majority of votes, you carry all the electoral college uh, votes. So why do you have to have electoral college votes? Uh, why, why would you not use the total votes cast? popular votes to determine uh, the winner of, from each state. Because the electoral votes, uh, once you win the popular votes of that state, you carry all the electoral votes. So I don't know why we have to rely on electoral votes when we are actually using popular votes mm -hmm. to determine who carries the electoral votes in each state. Um, my other observation is from Mexico. How do you keep the independent court members busy? during when there's no election? Because you say you're full time, so how do you keep them busy in between election periods? Since you don't conduct election every day and lawyers are very expensive people, can't afford to keep them idle. <laughs> Judge Thunheim, do you wanna? Yeah, let me, let me take the electoral college question. I mean, the true answer is that it is a relic of history that no one really wants to change because they're not sure of what the alternative will bring. We're comfortable with it in this country because it's been with us since uh, the first election. But truth be told, it was a device uh, written into the original Constitution to make sure that you know, learned uh, people who would really know what they're talking about would be the ones who would elect the president, not the voters. So that each state would get the number of electors equal to their members in Congress, you know, the House and the Senate. They would choose those people who would presumably be people who would know the potential candidates, would be uh, citizens in good standing, and they were the ones who were to choose the president. You know, when our Constitution was written, it wasn't even envisioned that we would have political parties. They're not part of the Constitution. Uh, the framers' debates really do not have any discussion of political parties. They were clueless about that. They didn't know that factions would develop within the political system. So, as it has evolved over the years, most states will uh, utilize the popular vote to determine who gets the electoral votes in a state. There are a couple of states that will divide their electoral votes. I believe it's Nebraska and Maine who have at least the potential of dividing up their electoral votes. And a state could do that now if they wanted to. If Virginia wanted to divide its electoral votes based on the basis of the uh, uh, number of popular votes each candidate got, they could do that. But uh, no one seems to want to change in part because everyone's comfortable with the system and can pre it's, it's fairly predictable as to how 
uh, the actors will work within the system. And even though it would make great logical sense to change it now in this day and age when we can accurately count the popular vote, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. There is one movement uh, afoot for the individual states to get together in a compact, uh, an agreement uh, that they would follow the national popular vote. Because if you, if our constitutional structure leaves the selection of the Electoral College members, as the judge explained, based on the number of uh, House and Senate members to the legislature, uh, the individual state legislatures could, and there's a movement afoot, uh, to circumvent the constitutional provision by agreeing that a state would follow the national popular vote. Whether that is permissible under the Constitution uh, is, is an open question, but clearly everyone recognizes that there is a disconnect between the popular vote and this historic electoral college, uh, which uh, is really an anti-democratic holdover from a period when only white male property owners could vote. And I would suggest that we have made, at least in America, some progress uh, toward, um, uh, toward an open franchise. I mean, women were not allowed to vote until uh, the beginning of the last century. And things have gotten better. It's a good question, my friend, and I won't answer observing elections, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are a country of uh, 110 million people. Our electoral registry is uh, made up of 86 million people. We have, a, on average, 15 elections each year, local elections and federal elections every three years, uh, legislative and president every six years, governor every six, but not all the governors are elected the same year. So we have elections every year in Mexico. And as I mentioned, we are the last instance um, uh, of the resolutions, jurisdictional instance uh, in resolving electoral challenges. And as I mentioned as well, we solve internal political parties disputes, which is very, very interesting. Last, last year, which, which was the day before the federal, the year before the, the federal elections, we solve around 35,000 challenges of political party members who wanted to become party leaders or be nominated at, as candidates, uh, mem party members who were sanctioned uh, because of uh, any resolution of the, of the party board. So we have a lot of, wor of work, and on average, not taking into account these party members' challenges and nor massive uh, uh, challenges as well, uh, we solve around 20,000 uh, cases a year. So we work a lot. Nuri Al Abbar, is <laughs> Nuri Al Abbar from Libya. Thank you, Mr. Jack, for being so frank in assessing the <laughs> electoral system in the U.S. But what I would like to ask about is that you have mentioned that uh, to look in the uh, complaints uh, uh, of the main elections might take time more than mon one month or two months. So what is the benefit of declaring uh, the, peop uh, the, the winner uh, which is uh, celebrated by all peoples in the United States regarding Obama. If these complaints are not going to change the results that has led to uh, the winning by Barack Obama, and if there were such cases, did it happen in the American history that after declaring the preliminary results, there could be a change as a result of uh, 
judicial uh, decision to change the results of the, uh, these elections? Never. Uh, على الإطلاق لم تغير نتائج الرأ... لم تغير النتائج الرئيسية ما رأيناه هو ما ذكرته وسائل الإعلام عما حدث. For a month, as we canvass, we go through verification of the numbers. All you saw was the media uh, basically um, solving our insatiable desire for knowledge. Uh, but still, a month would go by. Has there been instances um, that on state levels? There have been. Uh, Minnesota, actually, in the Senate race, uh, the results were slightly different, changed over time. Um, in the presidential election 2000, uh, you may recall that, the pre that Vice President Gore conceded in an unconceded. In very close elections, it can. But one of the things is to not to confuse the unofficial results that are announced by the news media last night from what will happen in the next month where we actually go through the certification of results where each of the precinct results are reviewed, absentee ballots are counted, they're recounted, uh, we get very precise as to the results. Uh, and then they are formally announced uh, a little bit before uh, the holiday season. Uh, and in the, for the president, the actual election in this electoral college uh, happens in the beginning of January. And if there's anyone in the audience that understands this electoral, electoral college thing, please come up here and explain it to Jack and I, because we're confused by it. <laughs> Well, th uh, please join me in, in thanking the panelists. Um, I hope that we uh, brought up some issues and, and explained some things that are, that are helpful for you. And um, enjoy the rest of your time at the conference. Thank you.